So again, I'm Sarah, and um, I'm going to talk to you about HLH. I think you're seeing more of it than you realize, and I'm honored to be able to share my enthusiasm with you today. So what we're going to run through really quickly is some case reports. I'm an adult stem cell transplant clinician. I don't have any disclosures, sorry, before that. And I should give a lot of credit to Nancy Berliner, who sees these patients on the benign heme side, and we work as a team. But we are really focused on adult HLH, so we'll go over adult case reports, the etiology and pathophysiology in general behind both pediatric and adult HLH, but then the unique presentation and drivers specific to adults with this syndrome, the challenges in diagnosis, some of the management algorithms, the role of transplantation, because I'm a transplanter, I'll spend just a little time on that, and then two sentences on our future hopes and trials. So case number one is a 65-year-old male who had no prior significant medical history. He presented, as many do, with flu-like symptoms and drenching night sweats. He then evolved pancytopenia, transaminitis, and persistent fevers to 103 Fahrenheit. And when he was worked up, a CT scan showed diffuse bulky lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly. He had a bone marrow biopsy, which was quite hypercellular, as you can see, and showed on closer examination hemophagocytosis. But he had no evidence of lymphoma in his marrow. He had biopsies of his lymph nodes that did not show any evidence of lymphoma. He had a ferritin of 45,000, a soluble interleukin-2 receptor of 199,000, with the normal being around 2,500 and then increased triglycerides and decreased fibrinogen. So as we'll see in a few slides, when we review the diagnostic criteria, he was sent to us with a diagnosis of adult onset HLH. Second case is a 33-year-old woman who had recurrent systemic inflammatory symptoms since the age of six months, and she had been worked up since then without any diagnosis. She manifested thrombocytopenia ever since the age of 10, and with her last pregnancy had ITP so badly, she underwent a splenectomy. Um, she had recurrent fevers, and prior to the splenectomy, had splenomegaly. And she had increasing flares provoked by sinusitis and URI symptoms, and ended up with two ICU admissions with SIRS, intubation, and DIC with no clear infectious precipitant or agent identified. Her ferritin on her prior admission prior to us seeing her was over 5,000. She also had soluble IL-2 receptor levels that were elevated, high triglycerides. That should be uh, low fibrinogen, not low ferritin there. And hemophagocytosis on the bone marrow. And if I have a pointer up here, what you can see is activated macrophages, phagocytosing both erythroid elements and myeloid elements on her marrow. She also had an increase in perforin and granzyme expression on her ANK and T cells, but when she was sent for function, cytotoxic function of those NK cells, that was decreased, which I highlight because that is one of the diagnostic criteria, and I'll tell you how you can send for testing. It's a bit of a logistical pain in the butt, but you can do it. Um, and case number three is a 60-year-old male, again with no prior medical history, who presented with fatigue. He was diagnosed or treated empirically for Lyme disease, although serology was negative, with a combination of doxy and steroids, and you'll notice the steroids made him a little better. But then he was admitted shortly afterwards with profound weakness, and his main manifestation was confusion that brought him in, purpura, and was found to be febrile, pancytopenic, with a very highly positive ANA, but no lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, and the labs, as you see below. On LP, there were no cells seen, just increased protein. He, as with the other two patients, had an extensive negative infectious and malignancy workup, so he also was referred to us with HLH of unclear etiology. So what all these patients have in common is that they fit the diagnostic criteria for HLH, which I have diagrammed out here, which is primarily based on clinical and laboratory findings, specifically, as you can read, fever, organomegaly, cytopenias, triglyceride and fibrinogen levels, and then ferritin and soluble IL-6 receptor being some of the ones that we really hang our hats on, and we'll talk about whether that's wise or not. You can send NK cell function activities, 
and hemophagocytosis is often found, but the sensitivity and specificity of hemophagocytosis in anyone with an inflammatory syndrome is pretty low for HLH, so you need to be aware. There also are molecular testing, as we can review, that meets the criteria, and the children manifest this more than adults, but most of the adults, as I've described in these three cases, come to us with no genetic testing and with a clinical syndrome. And these criteria, please remember, are entirely based on pediatric patients. So what is HLH? And when you realize how it works immunologically, you'll understand the genetic underpinnings. So to have effective cytotoxic T or NK cell killing, right, a lot of this is mediated by perforin and granzyme. So when you have perforin granules in your NK cells and your T cells, you actually need to have this released into the immunologic synapse to get rid of your virally infected cells or your leukemia lymphoma cells, get rid of antigen stimulation, and then downregulate the immune response. So your granule needs to be loaded with perforin and granzymes, needs to traffic to the membrane, to fuse, and to be released after which perforin makes these sort of pores in the cell membrane, and there is entry of granzymes and other factors that causes apoptosis. So remember, all of this has to happen in sequence. So when this is ineffective, what you get is uncontrolled T cell activation, right? So they're active and they can't actually achieve their purpose. You get secreted many cytokines. These are just some of the many, like interferon gamma, IL-12, IL-18, and they activate the macrophages. So we actually think of the macrophages as being the problem, but they're somewhat down the line because they are the benign. They are activated because of T-cell dysfunction with the resulting phagocytosis. Familial HLH, and I'll use the terms somewhat interchangeably, familial and genetically derived HLH is what we typically think kids have. That's identified with defects in this granule release pathway. And we don't really know in the acquired or adult onset forms what the pathophysiology is. There's some hypothesis that it's chronic antigen stimulation and some predisposition within the T and NK cell function pathways. So as I mentioned, familial HLH, we have some known defects that I'll outline on the la next slide. Some of them are unknown. And classic familial HLH is different than HLH that arises in the setting of other genetically defined immunodeficiency syndromes, such as Chediak Higashi, Griselli, and X-linked lymphoproliferative disorder, which not all those children get HLH, but a very high percentage of them do. And acquired HLH can be triggered by infection, autoimmune disease, and malignancy, and I'll show you that that's very different between children and adults. So here, when we talk about frank familial genetic HLH, these are the defects in the genes that we know about. F familial HLH1, we actually don't know the gene. We've just localized it to a locus on chromosome 9, so we are not really able to test for that. But we have known mutations in perforin. This is a gene for perforin, which you can induce apoptosis if you don't have perforin. MUNC13-4 is responsible for vesicle priming. Syntaxin is responsible for vesicle transport along with syntaxin binding protein 2, and then these are the congenital immunodeficiency syndromes. So if you are trying to work someone up for HLH, a lot of the stuff you can send in your local hospital, obviously ferritin, triglycerides, and fibrinogen. But this is, not, this is one place to send them. You can also send to the Mayo Clinic. But I've given you an example of their form because you can actually get NK cell function performed. You can get perforin and granzyme levels identified by flow. And you can send off for soluble IL-2 receptors. Call ahead, it's a real pain in the patootie to get this because flow assays, they have to receive the cells within 24 hours, Monday through Friday, yada, yada, but it is helpful. These tests turn around within about a week, and Cincinnati also has a um, multiplex PCR-based sequencing assay that actually assesses for all the HLH-related genes. What I've highlighted here in red are the ones that we discussed, which are associated with familial HLH, and then these others are part of the um, immunodeficiency panel, that can, diseases that can come with it. Like here, um, XIAP is one of the abnormalities in X-linked lymphoproliferative syndrome. And I think um, 
whereas at RAV 27A is in Griselli syndrome. So these are orderable. It does take a little bit of um, maneuvering, but you can do that to help in your diagnosis. In terms of what we standardly diagnose in the hospital, though, and who we see, I'm going to differentiate adult from pediatrics, where most of these patients really present less than two years of age. And if they have genetic mutations, they're usually biallelic mutations in things that we consider that I mentioned in that list, autosomal, re autosomal recessive, or they are compound heterozygotes. Adults, we're actually now seeing that 40% of the cases of HLH diagnosed are in adults, so that's why I'm harping on it. And specifically at Brigham and Women's Hospital, I can't remember what year it was, but when the H1N1 influenza strain was circulating, we saw a tripling in our HLH admissions. Whether it was just diagnosis or whether there actually are certain diseases that trigger HLH better than others is unclear, but definitely be on the lookout for this in your adult patients as well. Everybody has fever, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, less neurologic toxicity and complications in the adults. But what actually is quite different, and I'm going to spend a few minutes on this, is ferritin level. So really, we've all been trained in med school that this was the sine qua non. And if you have a ferritin greater than 10,000 in kids, it has a sensitivity and specificity for HLH of over 90%. In adults, not many of them have a ferritin this high, and as I'll show you on the next slide, even above 50,000, the sensitivity and specificity in adults for HLH is less than 20%. So it's part of the algorithm, but it doesn't define the syndrome. Soluble IL-2 receptor to ferritin ratio is actually something that has been explored in the adult literature as having a sensitivity of 85% for HLH. And one of the things that is being um, bandied about in a new diagnostic criteria is abnormal LFTs, because those are highly prevalent in adults and kids. I've highlighted this on the bottom because NK cell activity is such a pain in the rear to order that nobody orders it. So including in the diagnostic syndrome may not be relevant for the vast majority of individuals. This is um, one example of the data driving the high sensitivity and specificity of ferritin above 10,000 for pediatric HLH, as opposed to other pediatric syndromes that you can read on the right, like um, immunodeficiency, bone marrow failure, malignancy, and viral infection that may have elevated ferritins, but not nearly to that level. That's in contrast to this data from um, the Brigham and Women and MGH hospitals um, compiled by Dr. Schramm and Berliner, where they looked over 10 years at everybody who had an elevated ferritin. They found that about 113 patients actually had a diagnosis of HLH. So they looked at sensitivity and specificity, which, as I said, was under 20%, even for ferritin above 50,000. And in this group, only 15 of these actually had HLH. So again, that's not something, it's usually something that makes you think about HLH, but it shouldn't um, be the only thing that triggers your thought process. Other things you might be concerned about with hyperferritinemia, any inflammation, autoimmune disease, infection or malignancy can prompt that to go up. An elevated soluble IL-2 receptor, by the way, IL-2 receptors are expressed on T cells, B cells, lots of immune cells. The reason soluble IL-2 is up in um, HLH is because it's cleaved by those activated macrophages and some of the metalloproteinases in there. So you can see these in many different diseases, so the differ differential diagnosis is broad. In terms of the different drivers in children and adults, I recommend highly this paper and the one after it. If here you look at 800 patients in Japanese centers diagnosed with HLH and look at the subset that had all this data, these are kids between 1 and 14. The vast majority of them had their disease triggered by infection. If you look over here on the right to adults over 30 or over 60, you see an increasing percentage of them having their HLH associated with malignancy. If you further look over on the right, you see, well, yes, maybe it's because we're adults. We never do as well as kids with these diseases. But malignancy-associated HLH really does have an abysmal prognosis. <clears throat> 
This is just showing you the second paper I would highly recommend on over 2,000 cases published in the literature in um, the Lancet compiled in this review article showing that the drivers of HLH in adults vary by location. There may be some uh, genetic predispositions that fall within di different ethnic groups, but that overall viruses are the most prominent infectious trigger with EBV leading the way no matter where you are. And among non-infectious causes, this blue here is lymphoma. So really, this is why if we suspect HLH, we need to rule out viral infections. We need to rule out malignancies, especially lymphoma. And in this setting, there was a pretty even split between B cells and T cell lymphoma. I would mentioned that one of the studies in Japan found difference is in outcome when you had malignancy-associated disease. Here are two studies, one from the Mayo and one from Brigham and Women's, showing the prognosis between malignancy-associated and non-tumor-associated HLH on the left here between yellow and blue. And this here is the difference between rheumatologic, idiopathic, infectious, and malignancy-associated HLH. So how can we try to manage this? The standard algorithm that everyone touts is the HLH94 algorithm, which is still standing. And please note, it's from 113 children less than the age of 15. So when I get to the struggle of what we do with adults, this really is pediatric driven. There, they were treated with dexamethasone, tapering over eight weeks as demonstrated, etoposide bunched weekly or more at the first eight weeks and then spaced out, and a calcineurin inhibitor, specifically cyclosporin. There is a 2004 version, which just changes a little bit the intrathecal therapy for those who have CNS involvement and moves your calcineurin inhibitor up here. Um, the survival at three years, by the way, in all cases was only 55%. And I'll mention that I think my anecdotal experience is the sooner we diagnose this, the better people do. Um, the proven cases who had familial disease were 51% overall survival. But if you got them to transplant, those patients had a 62% survival. So this is the current algorithm focused on the red boxes. Patients who have, on the pediatric side, genetically driven disease or who are relapsed or refractory to initial therapy go to transplant. And if you'll notice here, once we get those patients to transplant, about 50% of them do, with the reduced intensity regimens, we have a much better outcome than we did historically. So the children actually were making some progress. In terms of adults, it's a hodgepodge of what we do. Here in the States, people tend to pursue the HLH regimen for adults as well, but there are some trials with IVIG, rituxan, especially for EBV-related or driven HLH. Um, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate. If you have a lymphoma or leukemia underlying your HLH, treat the malignancy for the majority of patients, the HLH will go away. There are case reports on anti-cytokine therapy. I also work with CAR T cells. I've tried tocilizumab in two patients, it doesn't work. I don't know why the cytokine storm that you're getting here is different, but it seems to be. There are also case reports of using TNF-alpha or interleukin-1 blockers. But what's most impressive, and I ask you to follow, there was an ASH late-breaking abstract this year on anti-interferon gamma therapy in children that was outrageously effective, and adult trials are in um, planning. But the adult survivals, unfortunately, range between 11 and 100 percent in some studies, which I highly doubt. Um, but we, <laughs> we need to do better. So one of the ways that we're doing better is we're actually understanding the disease. And I told you that the kids, about 25 percent of them, have biallelic mutations for one of these classical genes. Adults have it, too. <laughs> And so I'm now testing all of my adults, and we're finding that specifically in perforin, MUNC13, and syntaxin binding protein 2, at least 15% of adults that are just tested for HLH, even if, and I think it's a much higher in those who eventually have the diagnosis, they actually have these, usually just one mutation, and they tend to be hypomorphic alleles, so either less expression or less function, but not deletions, total loss of function, as opposed to the children. So we're understanding the genetic underpinnings of the disease better, and we think these are likely predisposing alleles. It's very confusing, though, if you try to say, okay, this is genetic HLH, because this mutation here in perforin is present in 4 to 7% of the adult population in the U.S., 
and 4 to 7 percent of us are not getting HLH. So how much this actually impacts HLH, do I need to take these people to transplant, is an unknown. So we really need longitudinal studies, which Nancy and I are trying to um, accomplish. So to wrap up in terms of these cases, the first gentleman underwent HLH therapy and did improve. He had no abnormalities identified on genetic testing, but when we tried to taper him off of steroids, despite being on tacrolimus and we had spaced out his etoposide, he flared. I was unable to bring him to transplant at that time because he had no fully matched donor. And as we continued to watch him, he developed a TCR gene rearrangement that was clonal, but we couldn't nail down a lymphoma. I gave him alemtuzumab, which is salvage therapy, anti-CD52. He had temporary improvement, and then an NK cell leukemia declared itself. So look really hard. The malignancy may be hard to find, but suspected in people who don't have a nice response. This woman, who was symptomatic since the age of six months old, was one of these late onset genetically driven HLHs. She turned out to be a compound heterozygote for syntaxin and SDXBP2 mutations. Why she didn't die at the age of two, I don't know, but she was able to percolate along. She had improvement on HLH-94 therapy, but as we tried to taper her, she again flared. I did bring her into a matched unrelated donor transplant using alemtuzumab and steroids right up to the point of conditioning, and she's now four years out. Um, she's a ski bunny in Vermont and uh, homeschooling her four kids. And the last one, he had um, come in with the mental status change. When he was started on DEX, um, he improved within hours. He also did have a perforin mutation, just one, not biallelic, so I didn't really know what to do, but his ferritin, LFTs, and counts normalized in two to three weeks, and he didn't budge as I tapered his etoposide and steroids. So despite him having a mutation, he, I've maintained on tacrolimus, I don't want to taper that yet, and he hasn't had a transplant, he hasn't had any events. So, not to overwhelm you, but genetics, does not tell us what to do in the adult world so far. We're trying to figure out what the genes mean. I'm really driving things based on are they relapsed or refractory to initial therapy? Even if they respond, are they slow to normalize their ferritin and counts? Those are the people that I take into transplant. And the question is, how do patients do post-transplant? This is data from the CIBMTR that is a little outdated, but I'm updated and writing up currently. If we can get these patients to transplant, these are um, 47 adults with histiocytic diseases, primarily HLH, there's a 60% three-year survival. So we actually could anticipate getting these patients to transplant. So in conclusions, really having a high suspicion aids in the diagnosis because there is such a broad differential, especially in adults. Our classic criteria is still based on the kids. Beware of the ferritin, it has a lot of caveats in the adults, and we're working on new instruments and criteria there. Adult HLH is definitely more skewed towards malignancies, please hunt hard for them, and understanding the role of the genetic mutations is still an evolution. As we evolve our management criteria, hopefully our prognosis will get better, Definitely earlier recognition is key, and my hope is really pinned not just on transplant, because I'm a transplanter, but also interfering gamma blockade to see if we can develop a standard approach to adults and actually improve prognosis. So thank you so much. I may not have time for questions, but I'll be around later.